Good evening, or good morning, or good afternoon. Welcome, wherever you are. My name is Jacqueline Jones, and as president-elect of the American Historical Association, I'm honored to introduce Professor Mary Lindemann, who will be delivering her 2021 presidential address right after my remarks. Although I'm sure you share my disappointment that we're not able to meet in person for an annual meeting this year, I'm delighted that we can welcome and hear from Professor Lindemann remotely. The presidential address is a cherished AHA tradition from 1884 when Andrew Dixon White delivered the first address, which he titled On Studies in General History and the History of Civilization. I encourage you to go to historians.org slash ML bio to read an appreciation of and testimonial to Professor Lindemann and her pathbreaking scholarship. Written by our former students, Stephen A. Laser and Erica Heinzen Roach. Professor Lindemann is a distinguished scholar of German, Dutch, and Flemish history. Her work ranges widely over the history of medicine, diplomacy, war, finance, commerce, and the state. Her deep archival research has enabled her to challenge a number of conventional narratives of early modern Europe. She blends an appreciation of larger structures and their change over time with the lived everyday experiences of ordinary people. To do this, she has gone boldly into archival collections where no one has gone before in the process exploring a wide number of historical themes and bringing to those themes a level of complexity that only comes from a close reading of multiple kinds of sources. She's a self-proclaimed archive junkie who delights in the twists and turns of research, that winding path that often takes us to places we could not anticipate before we started the journey. Professor Lindemann is a prolific scholar with seven single authored books since her first one was published in 1990. Patriots and Paupers, Hamburg, 1712 to 1830. Her book uh, published in 1996, Health and Healing in 18th Century Germany, won the American Association of History of Medicine William H. Welch Book Prize. In addition to monographs on sex, law, and diplomacy in the age of Fred Frederick the Great, and on the merchant republics of Amsterdam, Antwerp, and ha Hamburg, she has also written a survey of medicine and society in early modern Europe, translated into several languages, and a book of essays titled Ways of Knowing, 10 Interdisciplinary Essays. Her current project is The Fractured Lands, Northern Germany in an Age of Unending War. Over the course of her career, Professor Lindemann has won fellowships from many sources, including the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Guggenheim Foundation, and a number of residential fellowships that have helped to fund her research in Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, and other places. She believes strongly that teaching and research are closely intertwined and has shown great dedication to students at all levels as an innovative teacher introducing first years to the discipline of history, and as a greatly admired mentor to graduate students writing their own pathbreaking dissertations. Professor Lindemann has also received well-earned recognition as a leader in the academy. She currently chairs her department at the University of Miami, and she is just coming off her tenure as president of the German Studies Association. With two of her colleagues, she has co-edited Early Modern Women, an interdisciplinary journal. On a personal note, I'll just add that it's been a pleasure for me to work with Mary this past year. Her dedication to history and the well-being of all historians, combined with her level-headedness and good common sense, have made her an outstanding president of this association. These qualities have served the HA especially well over the last nine months when COVID-19 has upended our lives as scholars, teachers, and family and community members. Under Mary's leadership, the HA has sought to provide our members with the resources they need to get through this crisis. 
and at the same time respond to those outside the profession who crave a better understanding of the past. Mary has set a high standard for me this coming year. The title of Professor Lindemann's talk is Slow History. Her observations reflect her years in the archives and provide a bracing antidote to those persistent pressures on us to hurry up and be done with our work, to zip through the archives, to speed read and speed research. It's truly a talk for these turbulent times. Please join me in welcoming the president of the American Historical Association, Professor Mary Lindemann. Good evening. Before I begin my address, I would like to thank all of you for being here, albeit virtually. I am only sorry that we were not able to gather together in Seattle, but the decision to cancel the physical AHA this year was an exceedingly wise one. Next year, perhaps we shall see each other in New Orleans. I would also like to thank Jackie for that kind and generous introduction, and I hope I can live up to her billing. My final thanks must go to the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Miami for providing a videographer and a place to speak, and to the dean of the college, Leonidas Bacchus, for having made his office available for that purpose. We all recognize just how much COVID-19 has interfered with our scholarship and teaching. Everything has slowed down, from preparing for classes, to doing research, to completing the simplest tasks of everyday life. Yet in the upheaval we are currently experiencing, as we struggle to remain productive, and we quite justifiably bemoan projects delayed and teaching made more difficult, perhaps we should also seize the opportunity to reflect on the doing of history and to isolate what really matters in research, writing, and instruction. Indeed, slow has suddenly become fashionable as much as inevitable. A recent article in the Times Literary Supplement by the well-known scholar of Victorian literature, Annette Federico, related her experiences with teaching a course called Slow Dickens. By de-accelerating, by reading Dickens slowly, there would be no reason to skim, skip, or skimp. We'd allow ourselves time to scrupulously enjoy Dickens. But the payoff was greater. Slow reading, as Federico put it, activates our own facilities. But slow wasn't always so fashionable, and we as a society have not always appreciated its virtues. Indeed, they were often denigrated. Speed is the legacy of the 19th century, a function of faster transportation, the railroad, the bicycle, and later the automobile, faster communication, telegraph, then telephone, and the fast living of the bohemian avant-garde. Electric lighting, too, collapsed day into night and made hours hasty. Evermore, time became money, and the speed-up and specialization of Taylorism, the watchwords of efficiency and modernity. Stephen Kern, in his history of the culture of time and space, devoted an entire chapter to speed, charting the ways in which technology had transformed 19th century life. But speed not only altered communication and transportation, equally important, and perhaps even more so, was how speed inserted itself into culture and morality. It is interesting to note that Roger's Thesaurus, first published in 1852, lists mostly negative synonyms for slow. Indolent, languid, late, reluctant, stupid, and uninteresting. Of course, the virtues of speed did not sweep everyone along. As Kern also points out, there ran countercurrents, and tensions always existed between a speeding reality and a slower past, the latter often expressed in sentimental elegies about the good old days. Be that as it may, speed was here to stay and could be valorized in new theories about time and space, Einstein's famous work on relativity, but also in doggerel verse. There was a young lady named Bright, whose speed was faster than light. She set out one day in a relative way and returned home the previous night. 
Since the middle of the 20th century, and with accelerating velocity over the last 20 years, computer technology and the proliferation of devices that collapse time and distance even further, and that often reduce speech to sound bites, Instagrams, and tweets, dominate our lives. For so many of us, the most frequent form of human contact and communication over the last few months has been the eponymously named Zoom. We now Zoom around everywhere in the universe where the, we where the whizzing speed of electrons through the ether has obliterated distance. Yet, and despite the undeniable impact of these enhanced, if also slightly disturbing and disorienting forms of human interaction, or perhaps because of them, a new emphasis on slowness has set in as a direct response to the perceived negativity of speed. Some of it comes from Zoom fatigue and the strains of distance learning. Some of it bears strong elements of nostalgia and longing for older and putatively better ways of doing things. One root of this attitudinal shift, however, lies in the slow food movement, born in Italy in 1986, and that has since spread worldwide. Slow food may seem, have, may seem to have little connection to my topic of slow history, but bear with me for a moment and think of the many culinary terms that pop up in academic writing. Savor, taste, flavor, relish, temp, tantalize, stimmer, simmer, stew. Slow food might be seen, and has been seen, as something of a limited phenomenon and profoundly elitist. Yet it is also part and parcel of a much broader slow movement that has gained speed in the late 20th century, that is more academic in focus, and that touches more immediately on scholarly practices. In the second decade of the 21st century, many scientists worried about the implication of speed in scientific research promulgated a series of deliberately provocative manifestos, now collectively known as the slow science movement, of which the most widely known is the one published in 2010 by the Slow Science Academy in Germany. In a pointed attack on scientific superficiality, celebrity worship, and media mongering, they trumpeted it. We are scientists. We don't blog. We don't Twitter. We take our time. Of course, the purpose was to shock and to provoke debate. In this, the authors were successful. Contributors to major journals, including Nature, The Scientist, Scientific American, and The Atlantic, soon joined the fray. The manifesto directed its criticism at universities and research scholars who chase after grant money without spending nearly enough time mulling over the big scientific questions that still remain to be solved. Of course, not everyone was thrilled with the idea that science should slow down. And the proponents of slow science were characterized as Aesopian foxes, who, unable to participate in the rewards of fast science, read a science often practiced in universities, cried sour grapes. Moreover, many crit critics found their arguments muddled, vague, impractical, and unrealistic. Is there, then, any sense in thinking about slow history? or even postulating its existence? Or is history always slower than fields where real payoff in terms of prestige, jobs, and money comes more immediately? Perhaps. Yet as I thought about historical research, it seemed to me that there was much to say, and that a good deal has already been said, about the many ways in which history is slow, and wondered why the subject is not quite so brisant among historians as in other fields. To my knowledge, no slow history manifesto exists, with perhaps a single exception I will discuss later. Indeed, one might argue such reflection is unnecessary, because history is always slow. Yet very slow history has often been the target of satire and parody. We are all acquainted with the perfectionist scholars who tremble forever on the cusp of finishing their great books. In his brilliant social satire, Point Counterpoint, Aldous Huxley used a historian as the model for the procrastinate, idle rich. Ever since the publication of his first book, Mr. Quarles had been writing, or at least had been supposed to be writing, another much larger and more important one about democracy. He had been at work on it for more than seven years and, as yet, 
he had not even finished collecting the materials. Seven years to work on a book does not suggest to me a particularly languid pace. I would judge that many in this audience have taken much longer to produce good, thoroughly researched books and even articles. Here the problem is not being slow, but rather indolent and indeed rather silly, unable to separate important study from frivolous pursuits. Quarles will never get it done, not even with the help of his card indices, steel filing cabinets, very professional roll-top desk, and three typewriters with a large selection of alternative types. While Sidney Quarles took seven years to produce absolutely nothing, the very prolific Robert A. Caro is still, at age 85, hard at work on the fifth and final volume of his monumental and multiple award-winning biography of Lyndon Johnson. Volume four of The Years of Lyndon Johnson appeared nine years ago in 2012. Six years later, in an interview with the New York Review of Books, Caro estimated that it would be anywhere from two to ten years before he wrapped up the final installment. That's a lot of time spent working on an admittedly huge subject. Caro has recently reflected at some length on his career as a journalist and a writer of history and biography. Significantly, he chose the prosaic and humble title, Working, followed by an equally prosaic subtitle, Researching, Interviewing, Writing. Taking the advice of an early mentor to turn every goddamn page, Caro became a res relentless, even obsessive researcher and something like an archive junkie. Even earlier, while Caro was still a student, a wise professor advised him that he would never be as good as he could be until he stopped thinking with his fingers. That is, unless he realized that just because writing came to him so easily, it was easy. And what did he do to break that bad habit? I decided to slow myself down. That is why I resolved to write my first drafts in longhand before I started doing later drafts on the typewriter. Many exceedingly accomplished historians have mused on the intellect process, interlinked processes of research and writing in ways that emphasize the virtues of going slow. I recently read John Eliot's coming of age story that forms the first chapter of his history in the making. It is a deeply personal account of how and why he became interested in Spain and Spanish history. Much seemingly occurred by chance, a youthful summer vacation, inspiration from teachers, and, of course, the intellectual currents of 1950s Britain. This confluence of circumstances appears familiar to many of us. His process of researching the dissertation and the path to the pro final product twisted and turned. His initial immersion in the Simancas archives proved exhilarating, but exhilaration soon turned to frusta frustration. Calling up bundle after bundle of state papers, he soon discovered that none of them contained the kind of material I had confidently expected to find. It was a greenhorn's mistake for a person who eventually became one of the premier scholars of the late 20th century. Yet in retrospect, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to him professionally and taught him and teaches us an especially pertinent lesson about research. Things never go as planned, and that is a good thing, as Eliot himself later realized, although he was probably far less calm at the moment as he watched his dissertation and perhaps his career go off the rails. The other lesson to be learned here is one by no means unique to Sir John Eliot, but forms part and parcel of how really good history takes shape. It is always in the making. And like Penelope waiting for the return of Odysseus, Often what we weave during the day, we pick apart in sleepless nights. Like Robert Caro's relentless search for the roots of power and the sense of place that explained men like Robert Moses and Lyndon Johnson, Eliot's quest for a historical understanding of Spain's decline, or Natalie Davis's decades-long pursuit of people on the margins, were ever evolving. Moreover, the archival experience, the slow struggle with the documents, molded the interpretations and the histories they created. Archival work is necessarily slow and painstaking, but its slowness has little to do with being mechanical or dull. 
Sources are not dead, even ones hundreds of years old and often preserved in dreadfully mutilated conditions. There is nothing transparent about an archive or a document. The archive masks as much as it reveals. We wrestle with documents that, despite the imprisonment of words on a page, keep taking on new and often surprising shapes. Even those that seem the least ambiguous are filled with nuances, complexities, contradictions, and, at the risk of anthropomorphizing, exhibit their own little deviltries. In a conversation with Denis Crozet, Natalie Davis caught the dilemma. She related how, having documents and manuscripts in my hands, immediately produced a feeling of connection. But she also perceived the dangers. Whenever she warns, I have the impression that I have met, touched, seized the past. I say, watch out, you'll be taken over by a romantic fantasy. There exists, therefore, a real danger that one can fetishize the archive by treating the traditional archive filled with books, papers, and iconographic materials as somehow the only legitimate source of historical knowledge and the only true place for historians to set their spades. Archival sources are, however, anything but transparent. For that reason, work in the archives can simultaneously be incredibly satisfying, fulfilling, exciting, and rewarding, but also difficult, confusing, humbling, and perplexing. There is no truth there, but there is history, especially when, when one recognizes, as we all should, that the bricks-and-mortar archive by no means serves as the sole depository of historical records. Archives teach us valuable lessons in slowness that we probably never lose. Robert Caro's life turned around when he was left alone one night with the records of the Federal Aviation Administration. I will never forget that night, he reminisced. It was the first time I had ever gone through files. Somehow, in a strange way, sitting there, going through them, I felt at home. It was love at first sight. Caro's experience is hardly unusual, and it would take me — it would not take me long to find many others to match it. Few people, however, have offered a more elegant homage to archival joys than Arlette Farge. The allure of the archives is a sustained love story for the dusty, dirty, promising, yet often maddeningly complex and obstinate materials found in archival and manuscript collections. Despite uncomfortable seats, smelly co-users, bad lighting, cold rooms, and the often bizarre rituals that govern archival life, she loves it. And that love is reflected in language that is positively sensual, that conveys the smell of the paper, the crinkliness of it between your fingers, the very dust that arises, and the almost sexual thrill of a great find. Archives inevitably slow you down. And not only because of the crabbed hands and shaky orthography of the long dead. Far more important is the link between document and thought process. Farge again. One cannot overstate how slow work in the archives is, and how this slowness of hands and thoughts is a source of creativity. She never denies that the many tasks archival work requires are often boring, but nonetheless generative. Farge also communicates no sense here that documents are transparent or obvious, nor even the breadth of a suggestion that they can convey by themselves what Leopold von Ranke's Vies eigentliche Wesen has often been taken to mean, how it actually was. The history produced by such a creative archival experience can also not be sneeringly dismissed as crass empiricism. Rather, <clears throat> a thoughtful, prolonged, and above all, active archival encounter produces a richly documented and rigorously analytical history and helps us avoid a simple recitation of facts. Robert Darnton referred to it once as marinating in the sources, picking up this apt culinary metaphor from a consummate stylist and gourmand, Gustave Flaubert. Darnton emphasized the importance of artisanal work, reading slowly through the documents, summarizing their contents, copying out key passages, and writing an interpretive note to yourself about their importance. So you observe a great — you absorb a great deal. Archival work 
as Farge, Caro, Elliot, Darton, and many others understand it, is by no means mechanical, nor is the archive a supermarket where researchers rush along the aisles, pulling off the meats, vegetables, sauces, and spices that they believe will eventually result in a harmonious blend of flavors. All too often, that method cooks up a meal lacking taste, substance, and essential ingredients that have been missed in the hurry to get something on the table, that is, in scholarly terms, to produce a published work. As a scholarly method, archival marination may seem unacceptably iffy, or rather a mysterious process that prestidigitates history into an existence, or too touchy-feely to be rigorous and respectable. It is not. Rather, it is anchored in Caro's sense of work, a humble, sweaty, hard, and yet imperfect endeavor. Likewise, serendipity plays a strange role in this process. We all know stories of great finds in the archives, such as Darton's discovery of the records of the Société Typographique in Neuchâtel. It was indeed a treasure trove. But the documents alone did not make the history. The historian did. Similarly, one is not hard-pressed to think of cases where the evidence of the existence of materials was long known, but discounted as unimportant or unworkable. One immediately thinks of Martha Ballard's diary. For decades, scholars regarded it as too repetitive and too mundane to be useful except as a gleaning ground for tidbits about frontier life in the early republic, until Laura Thatcher Ulrich wrote A Midwife's Tale. Likewise, accidental discoveries in the archive, the diary of a Spanish tailor during the plague, the account of an urban magistrate during the Thirty Years' War, the many other voices of early modern women, of minorities and indigenous peoples, and, of course, the obscure and often fragmentary narratives preserved as ego documents were not merely chance discoveries. Those famous finds usually resulted, however, from weeks and months of slowly and laboriously turning pages and then following up on what may be hunches, but hunches informed by deep familiarity with the sources. Archives are, of course, as Alexandra Walsham wrote in 2016, the factories and laboratories of the historian. And to use them skillfully requires knowing how they were created, by whom, and for what purposes. Too often, Walsham warned, we mine the documentary, source, the documentary sources they house without scrutinizing the decisions about selection, arrangement, presentation and retention taken by those responsible for the care of their contents. We still fall into the trap of approaching them as if they provide a transparent window through which we can view societies remote from us in time. Archivists always choose what to keep and what to cast aside, or where and how to catalog materials. As scholarly tastes evolve, the task of identifying sources requires some delicate detective work into the organization of archives to force them to yield up their secrets. This observation singles the necessity for another equally vital form of slowness, the time taken to learn the archives not merely as the object, but actually as the subject of inquiry. Indeed, over the past decades, a study of archives qua archives has challenged scholars to rewrite archival history. Traditional archives, those located in imposing edifices or those professionally curated, do not necessarily offer the only or best avenue for historians to explore or even the richest sources. Over the last decade, scholars have substantially altered and expanded the idea of an archive. The classic form of the state archive no longer adequately fills the definitional box. A partial list of new archives includes non-governmental records, oral histories, material objects, memories, the city is archive, the body is archive, the plantation is archive, the archive is art, and art is archive. Some have even asserted that it is perhaps silly to try to define archive or archives at all. As Eric Kettler, professor of archives and information studies at the University of Amsterdam proposed, let anything be an archive and let everyone be an archivist. While I find the implications of such an archival multiverse somewhat confusing, Kettler's statement reflects recent thinking about where historical, historical documentation exists. And his perception pays off in several fields. For example, in the history of enslaved people, 
of peoples without a written record, and especially those who communicate in pictorial or other nonverbal or nonscribal forms. Likewise, several historians have broadened the idea of an archive to include literary works. Contemporary literature serves as an archive of past imagination. Such literary texts are not merely fictions. Rather, they are the repositories of the way people in the past understood themselves and the culture in which they lived. Like all archives, this one, too, must be read deliberately, critically, and slowly. This more recent understanding of what constitutes an archive developed in lockstep with the growth of multi- and interdisciplinary, intersectional, and global histories. As scholars became more cognizant of the deficiencies in monodisciplinary history, I think I just invented a word, and as historians experimented with new forms of writing and drew on other disciplines, we were also forced to learn about and exploit new archives, as well as to acquire expertise or at least familiarity with differing fields, disciplines, theories, and methodologies. That imperative, too, slows us down, or certainly should, as we cautiously enter these strange new lands. In enumerating the perils of working in disciplines other than one's own, Marshall Salins urged caution and humility. It is the process by which the unknowns of one's own subject are multiplied by the uncertainties of another science. To do so effectively, however, takes time. Time to learn from our fellow researchers, time to evaluate the worth of perspectives and forms of analysis that may first seem alien to us, and time to incorporate those perspectives with at least a modicum of expertise. Here, too, archival research and interdisciplinarity combine to retard progress. But they also enrich and deepen, if also complicate, our histories and our lives without frequently transforming, while frequently transforming, our original topics into something wholly unexpected. Many interpretive turns have strongly influenced historical research and writing over the last several decades. While these often lead to new insights and interpretations, they also slow our progress, albeit fruitfully. The linguistic turn urged us to question historical objectivity and argue that the past only exists in our textual representations of it. In the 1990s, the spatial turn highlighted the shaping powers of place and landscape and affected, among other subjects, gender studies, social labor and political history, and the history of science. More recently, an organization of American historians' virtual panel examined the archival turn. The proliferation of such turns is dizzying. And in addition to these, the now familiar almost in addition to these and the now familiar, almost venerable cultural turn, we are spun on a carousel of other turns, the pictorial or iconic, sensory, material, and finally the research, the resource turn. We may accept, reject, or partially integrate such perspectives, but it is the process of thinking each one through in respect not only to our research but also our teaching that makes us slower historians but also better ones, even if, at times, we may feel led astray. Repeated false starts and recoveries have characterized my own research, and it took me quite a long time to accept that what I first considered a problem was instead a good thing and not the embarrassing revelation of ill-preparedness or naive misconception, or at least not mostly. I have come around to regarding false starts, dead ends, and confusion not as mistakes I should have avoided, but rather as opportunities. I can honestly say that no research project I have ever launched comes out in the end looking remotely like anything I originally planned. A few years ago, I embarked on a new project, now well advanced, that began by looking at the recovery of Brandenburg after the Thirty Years' War, in an age of what I characterized as unending conflict. At first, I knew little about the relevant archives. I had never worked on Brandenburg or Prussia, and other scholars had already told the story in one key as the rise of Prussia. It was, however, a well-worn interpretation that focused on the government initiatives to recover Brandenburg from the ravages of war. Even at the outset, I had little interest in repeating or merely adding nuance to that narrative, to a narrative that granted the lion's share of credit 
to the hyperactive electors and later kings of Brandenburg, Prussia, who supposedly, almost single-handedly, had rescued their territory from the wartime wreck. I was pretty sure that analysis was incomplete and perhaps even wrong-headed. The political or even economic track I thought I was following twisted beneath my feet and soon led me to something very different, to a recognition of the effect of war on the landscape and the vast multiplicity of agents involved in what is facilely termed the rebuilding process. I soon realized that this research needed to be more focused on village communities, small towns, and individual estate proprietors. These people, whom historians have often ignored, in fact, transformed Brandenburg. Even the essentially administrative and political documents I first consulted produced wisps of information that soon beckoned me into, the very different, into very different paths and suggested to me that an analysis not only about and suggested to me an analysis not only about the interaction of government initiatives and localities or that stressed the tensions between central control and local intransigence, but that considered seriously the many far smaller initiatives taken during 30 years of war and its long and turbulent aftermath. Contact with these documents, often fragmented, execrably written, and sometimes reduced to lacy fragments by the working of time, mold, and voracious insects, produced another aha moment. What mattered was the manipulation of local resources and the very landscape that numerous actors inhabited, managed, and altered, and in which their identities rooted. I suddenly was becoming a very different historian, one whose interest centered on the constant reshaping of fields, waterways, borders, and forests, a reshaping vastly accelerated and transformed by the experience of war. Had I become an environmental historian, or at least a historian of landscape? Well, perhaps, but not intentionally. The documents made me do it. As these examples also suggest, the more we work globally, interdisciplinarily, multidisciplinarily, and intersectionally, the slower we are bound to become. That retardation extends to writing and editorial processes. I admit that I have not found many explicit statements on slow history, but the one I did locate was a blog by an American by an early Americanist and historian of Native American and indigenous peoples, Christine De Luca. Christine De Luca. Such scholars often collaborate closely with their subjects, and not only at the stage of research, but also in the editorial process, which is De Luca's point. I have come to insist, she wrote, upon the importance of creating time and space within scholarly processes for the types of responsiveness that ought to be integral to any work that pertains to indigenous communities. What happened, she notes, not only reoriented her ethical compasses, but also, perhaps more important in this context, produced a sharpening of critical intellects through collaboration, editorial feedback, and the writing process itself. If a published piece results, she noted, it reflects some exceedingly slow ways of doing history. Delukia casts her web of relationships widely, but most historians construct similar webs with those friends we never meet, the colleagues whose books we read. I have often been struck by how expansively and intricately woven are the meshworks we knit, we knit from wide reading, reading so often done not for our research but our teaching. Here, too, one should point out how teaching itself greatly contributes to slow history. I am not speaking here of the obvious need to put our research aside, to get on with our day jobs. The supposed dichotomy between research and teaching, expressed in the hackneyed phrase, those who can do, those who can't teach, is fallacious as well as pernicious. The interaction of research and teaching is synergistic and mutually productive. Admittedly. Not all our scholarship dovetails neatly with our classroom teaching. The slowness teaching imposes upon us has a very different quality. It is the time we take, or should take, to think about what we teach, how we teach it, to prepare in detail for our classes, to assimilate new ideas and technologies. Furthermore, thinking about how we teach schools us how to present our ideas in print. Moreover, it constantly reminds us that while detail is important, well-conceived and well-presented interpretations are what stick. Bill Cronin's 2013 presidential address 
simply titled Storytelling, raised the question, how can we make the past come alive? His answer, by telling stories about it. He named a series of well-known historians familiar to all of us as consummate storytellers. For me, the centerpiece of his address, as I believe he intended, was the personal story he told about an instructor at Wisconsin. Dick Ringler, now emeritus professor of English and Scandinavian studies, Cronin admitted, changed my life forever and may well be the reason I am delivering a presidential address to the American Historical Association. What made Ringler so unusual and so wonderful was the brilliance produced by being slow. Bill Cronin didn't phrase it that way, of course. Rather than recounting how Ringler rehearsed his lectures, word for word, expression for expression, tone for tone, before each class, Cronin pinpointed Ringler's pedagogic genius. Brilliance is scripted, and that scripting took labor, or Robert Caro's work, repetition, and of course, time. A lecture is one thing, but exactly the same sort of work goes in ma into making a historical narrative and a historical analysis effective and convincing. Careful reworking, rethinking, and recasting over time does the trick. It is slow, it is meticulous, and it's incredibly successful. This observation brings me to my final point, my final argument for the virtues of slowing down. And it also circles me back to Robert Caro. The process of writing. Is there anything more destructive of confidence than writing? Does it ever go well? A recent and somewhat frivolous discussion online involved a number of scholars in the question of how much one should write in a day. Surely the better question is, how much should one write in a day? Few of us are like James Michener, who could reel out thousands of words at a single sitting. Few of us would probably wish to imitate his style. Most of us, I believe, are far more like Caro. I am not sure I ever think the writing is going well, he said. It is a real mistake to get too confident about what I've written. I'd do so much writing and rewriting. I'd rewrite the finished book if I could. Nonetheless, he produced on average what he described as his quota, three pages a day. Most of us would be tickled, tickled pink at achieving that goal. But there is little value in simply writing at warp speed. Yet in the more we write, and for that matter, the more we teach, we achieve ever greater facility with language and become adroit in crafting thoughts into words. Still, good prose takes an awful lot of time. We write, we rewrite, we organize, we reorganize, and then we do it all over again. Words are elusive and dangerous creatures. Even Gustave Flaubert mulled over the single appropriate word as he reclined on his sofa. Writing to Guy de Maupassant, he expressed his relentless search for words. There is but one name for a thing, one verb to set it in motion, and one adjective to describe it. Most of us are not quite so finicky, but wisdom lies in the idea that how you say something is as important as what you say. Flaubert again, writing well is everything. Coaxing substance and style to march in unison, however, proves a ticklish task and is often painfully slow work as well. The sensitivity to selecting words and shaping sentences that effectively convey our thoughts is not inborn, but something gradually, even painfully, acquired. Yet it remains imperfect, always becoming, never quite there. But take heart. Historians are, after all, long-distance runners, not sprinters. In the end, these many slows make us successful storytellers, historians, writers, and teachers. I drafted this talk rather quickly during the month of April as social distancing confined me to the square footage of my house. In approximately three and a half weeks of pecking away at my computer and devoting about half time to the task, by early May, I had a rough draft of the long version. That was my goal. And I was more or less satisfied with the piece. And perhaps in a moment of self-congratulation and weakness, even thought, well, that's almost done. But it wasn't, of course. Days were spent in tinkering, adding new materials, discarding what seemed extraneous or off point. Almost every day, I asked myself, does this really say what I want it to say? Over the awful summer and early fall of 2020, I repeatedly returned to the draft and was never, and am not now, totally happy with what I have wrought. But perhaps that's right. And like confusion, dissatisfaction is probably the first step towards doing really good 
history. Thank you very much.